Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes, and today I'm once again joined by Jim Simonetti and Stevie Mullen. Welcome to the show, guys. Pleasure, guys. Thanks for having me back. Thanks for us. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. As always, Stevie, you raised a, a very important point yesterday in relation to the songs that are sang at Celtic Park, and we'll be talking about that. We'll be opening a debate in relation to what should and shouldn't be heard around Celtic Park um, as we move into an era, hopefully, of returning to football grounds. So we'll have a wee look at that and we'll, we'll invite as much input as possible from our followers on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. There's a few other subjects to discuss. First, first of all, um, we heard the sad news of the passing of Pat McCluskey, ex-Celtic player. He's a man who... He actually played in two European Cup semi-finals, Stevie. You know, he played in the four games, came on as a sub in the first leg against Inter Milan, started the second leg, he scored in the penalty shootout and Celtic obviously were eliminated, unfortunately. So he scored in a European Cup semi-final and he was part of the infamous game against Atletico Madrid two years later. He also won cups and leagues with Celtic as well, part of the nine-in-a-row team. What's your memories of Pat McCluskey? First of all, condolences to Pat and his family and his friends. It's a real sad, sad loss. Pat could play out a midfield or defence. Hardy guy with no small amount of ability. Uh, pleasure to have met him on numerous occasions. Really, really nice man. And really, really sad that he's passing. One of our sort of stalwarts from that era has passed again and it's real condolences to everybody. Absolutely. Jim, when you think back, we're talking about a guy here who played in two European Cup semi-finals for Celtic. Yeah. You know, he's he's etched in the history of the club. I never met him, Stevie, but I did have the opportunity to speak to him when I was writing one of my books. And he was a gentleman, he was funny, he was engaging, he spoke about his, his pride in having played for Celtic. And I always remember him saying when he first came back as a Dumbarton player, he automatically walked into the home dressing room. You know, Celtic were part of his, his makeup. What's your memories yourself, Jim, of Pat McCluskey? He reiterates Stephen's uh, words there, uh, condolences uh, to all his family and friends. Um, fantastic midfield player, you know, uh, he won uh, three, I think it's three league championships and two Scottish Cups with Celtic, uh, but the memorable uh, night with Pat McCluskey is um, uh, the Atletico Madrid game. Mm-hmm. You know, and obviously, uh, we get absolutely kicked off the park that night. But every Celtic player stood up for one another and showed what a great uh, team they were and great teammates. And again, we keep saying, once a Celtic player, always a Celtic player. And uh, I just, I used to think he, he, he was. Cracking in midfield, Stevie, cracking in defence, an overall, an overall fantastic player of our, our called era. And uh, more like Pat McCluskey today would be uh, would be fantastic. So, um, condolences. Another wee thing as well, Jim, you know, most of the guys who would have played against Athletic Madrid come through the junior game. Aye. You know, to get tough and done, Aye. Pat was at Mary Hill. Right. You know, from Kilsyth, played for Mary Hill, got toughened up. Same as some legendary Celtic players who also, right. also played for Mary Hill. Right. So it's a great breeding ground if we could maybe get back some of the boys to do that. But again, it's testament to Pat that he took that experience and progressed in his career. He mm. had a really good career with Celtic and more prominently Dumbarton. Aye, and it's players it's players like that that we, we should never forget. Uh, even going back to uh, the first nine, nine in a row... Uh, all those players that were part of that and part of history is very important. But players maybe uh, back in the day, Stephen, they went out to the junior teams, uh, Paul, and and it helped them immensely in their mm. game. Mm-hmm. And then they came back. Even players like Jinky as well, c- coming back in, made them better. So m- maybe that's something that should be, be looked at again to help, help players all around to go back into a teams like St Rock's. And, and various other 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 teams within the, the ranks. I know you're moving away for the so-called juniors now, but it would still be a great experience for, for the guys to be in there. I, I know we're, we're talking about Pat. 
But here's a wee question for both of you. See, between the two nine in a rows, yeah. do you think any of the players from the second nine would get into the good teams of the first nine? Great question. It's a, it's a debate. It's a big debate. In Great fact, question. it's a whole show, that one. Yeah. That's brilliant. <laughs> Steve, just keep coming in. You're giving us good themes. <laughs> You're giving us good themes. Um, I think that's brilliant. Would I even be qualified to answer the question because I've not seen the first? But you do your research, you're yeah. always look, looking at things, you've mm-hmm. got great stats, you know, the video footage is there for most of it. So yeah. I, I think everybody's entitled to an opinion. Mm-hmm. You know, gonna, I've, I've never, I'm going to go back to your old analogy, I've never sat in a racehorse, but I can tell you it's going to win every race. Until <laughs> 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 we start. <laughs> I, I'm actually going to have a wee think about that, Stephen. And I think there is, I think there is. So I'm going to think about that and I'm going to come back to you. Is that all right? Definitely. But see, it's, it's, just, it's just because it's Pat's error, and that's the one that we're talking about today. Because Pat, Pat was a very, very good player. Very good player. Paul, what, what do you think then? And maybe put out to the viewers uh, the best uh, team for the first nine in a row and, uh, and uh, the second nine in a row. Obviously, the lines are in there. Well, you know, a bit difficult. A lot quality, of people. Quality kids. Uh, quality a lot of people, yeah, that, that's the thing when you look at it. And I asked. I've asked Lisbon Lines a question, Stevie. Would any, when I was writing my book and I'm focusing on the Quality Street kids, would any of those players have made it into the, the Lisbon team? Now, you wouldn't change the Lisbon team because they won. They won the European Cup. You couldn't change it. But on an individual basis, some people did say, well, Danny McGrain, yeah, at right back. Kenny Dalgleish was another one that was mentioned. And actually, George Conley was mentioned as well. But then you wouldn't drop any Lisbon lines because they won everything in their path. But as individuals, maybe one or two of the players were individually better than some of the... And again, I, I'm talking about guys I've never seen playing live. So I'm, I'm just going by other people who are there. It's a difficult question. You've got to throw it out. You've got to throw it out to the, the people who are tuning into a Celtic state of mind every day. But once again, what a great theme uh, to go by. What is the, be- the best team from the nine years... Uh, in the first nine in a row, what's the best team from the last nine years? And would any of the current players get into the, the first nine? Great question. It is a great question. But, and, you know, after Bayern Munich won in the, a, the European Cup the other night there as well, took a wee note for you today as well. That's, uh, they're the ninth team in history to win a treble of League Cup in a, 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 a European Cup or a Champions League. Right. First ever team was Celtic. Ever to do it. Ajax, PSV, Man United, Barcelona, and Milan, Bayern Munich, Barcelona, and then Bayern Munich again. So we're first in the just when you mentioned the Lions there, mm-hmm. we lead the way. So I wouldn't take the Lions out of any team. Well, I think it's alarming as well, Jim. Aye. You know that the other night's final, I think it was the first time since 2009 that actually two champions had contested the final. Aye. Aye. Amazing. I know. When we're, we're looking at um, Pat McCluskey, we've spoken about that Atletico Madrid game, and obviously. Celtic in the first leg at Celtic Park, the game was 0-0. Jimmy Johnson got booted up and down the pitch. Jim, there's a famous picture of him sitting on the treatment table, Aye. legs covered in bruises. Death threats when he went over to, to play them over there. And uh, you know the famous story about Bobby Lennox and Jimmy sharing the room. And Wee Jinky thinks that, he's, that there's going to be a sniper. And he, and he starts eating the apple. You heard the story? Right. And Bobby says, you know, how do you know they've no poison the apple? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, actually uh, hey, I say, I asked the, the wee man, he says, Atletico Madrid game was, was some game for you, was it? No, he says, I think they underestimated me that night. <laughs> Yeah, they underestimated me. But, but that was brutality. That that was the oh. game of football that night. Just absolute brutality. Well, everybody I've spoken to who was involved in the game, I've always asked them the question about what happened in the tunnel. Uh, obviously, was it full time? It would have been full time, yeah. eh? And there was a big rock in the tunnel. And no one will tell us exactly what happened. And Pat was one of the players I spoke That's to right. about it. He says, Look, listen, Paul, you know, what happened in that tunnel will stay with the players who was in the tunnel. But I think Davey Hay was involved. And going by the way that Pat was, I think Pat was involved, a few yeah, a few Pat punches would, were thrown. I think Pat would have been pretty handy. Aye, I think handy. David would have been pretty handy. That's, but again, they've got to stick up for their teammates. 100%. Yeah. There's a few subjects. I mean, as Stevie and Jim have already said, condolences from everyone at Celtic State of Mind for the family and friends of Pat McCluskey. Um, people close to him, I think Andy Lynch told me that, you know, Pat was a great singer and his, uh, his dad was a talented singer. So... 
Um, it's people have got fond memories of Pat McCluskey. So um, rest in peace. There's a lot of messages coming through. Please keep them coming. There's a few other subjects to to get through as well, Stevie. Before we start talking about the headline, uh, which you raised yesterday, we're talking about songs which. Um, were never questioned, I don't think, before a certain era, but now they're being outlawed at football grounds and particularly at Celtic Park due to our Irish heritage. And we're going to be speaking about that debate as well and opening it up to the people who tune in to the Celtic State of Mind Bulletin. Uh, before we do that, there's loads of transfer talk this morning. We're talking David Turnbull, Shane Duffy, uh, Aaron Hickey still being mentioned, Odson Edwards. And you mentioned to me when you came in, Rick Welm as well has been mentioned. Yep. So first and foremost, it uh, looks as though there might be a, a, a deal to be done, struck with Motherwell for David Turnbull. What's your thoughts on that? £3 million being cited? I think it's, hopefully it'll go through today or tonight. And I think there's two players going from Celtic on loan to Motherwell for a season's part of the deal. So you, you would like to get David Turnbull in. You know, he, he, he's ideal. Yeah. You know, he's a good player. As you go, I think we still need cover for left back. Mm-hmm. I don't know if Aaron Hickey will be coming. Uh, still hearing that Barry Douglas is on the radar. I think a centre half's necessity, and I'm sure we'll bring one in. Hopefully, it's Shane Duffy. If it's not, I've got every confidence that Neil and his backroom staff will bring somebody else in. I, I, again, if we're looking at Celtic as a whole, I've got to congratulate Dermot, Peter, and Neil and his backroom staff for the amount of money they're investing in the team for this vital, vital season. Yeah. But we get pelters every year, a lot of it from our own fans, but I think this year they've really pushed the boat out. I'd agree with that, a, a Stephen. And a, a few shows ago as well, we discussed about the spending, and I think we were all in agreement uh, that day that if, if they spend wisely and they spend... Uh, the amount of money that they've got to spend to see us uh, through this season, all the fans will be happy. I'm certainly happy at the moment. But if you look, we've got up to New Jim, Marcus, Eli Nussi, mm-hmm. Ayeti. Yeah, you know, three big, big players in. Good yeah. players, and then yeah. we're backing it up Aye. with some real quality. I know, like the younger guys, you're banking on a lot of potential. But they're real, real quality guys, you know, that hopefully we'll just be able to come in and push for a place. Aye, and listen, credit where credit's due with, with Peter as well and, and the board. They're, they've no, they've not let anybody done. They're, they're doing it the right way, and there's more to come. There's more to come. See, when you look at David Turnbull, um, I would ask the question is he the most promising Scottish youngsters in, youngster in Scottish football at this moment in time? For me, I would either say it's either him or the boy Ferguson at Aberdeen. Mm-hmm. For, for that, that position in midfield, I know they've Aye. slightly played differently, but I think they too have got a real chance in the future. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think back again to signing um, Phil O'Donnell from Motherwell. I remember it was a player who had been on the radar for a yeah. long time and he came in at that time and you just thought he was going to be the perfect foil for McStay and Collins, you know, and then you had the enforcer, which was Peter Grant. He was a fantastic signing back then. And I'm looking at Turnbull, the way he's come back from adversity uh, with with his injury as well, Stevie. Um, and I think yeah, there's a determination about the lad that he's come in. And if it's £3 million, pounds, I think most of that's up front uh, with, with another part payment, depending on appearances. I think it would be an astute signing at this time. We're, we are well covered in midfield. Would that maybe be on the back of Roderick leaving the building is there still question marks around in Cham would you say well we've got to the 25th of October mm-hmm. I think for the English clubs so our necessity to do business is more immediate than theirs because we're playing the league games just now on the Champions League so we need to do our business earlier than these guys but there'll still be loads of movement and it might result in some of your players going because you can't just carry everybody no. and the nostalgia oh he was great he was understand the, the sentiments that people have for some of these players but it's time to move move yeah I think so Shane Duffy on the the point of Shane Duffy we had uh, Spencer Vignes on the podcast probably a couple of months ago now Stevie and he is a Brighton and Hove Albion fan 
but he's an author as well, so he knows the history, knows the club inside out. So he's offered a wee bit of an insight into Shane Duffy. And he reckons that he's more or less been out of favour ever since Graham uh, Porter uh, arrived at the club. So it doesn't look as though he's going to get back in. Uh, he did mention that Shane Duffy likes a pint, not to excess. <laughs> Uh, but it's one of these things in the modern game when they're looking for the, the model professional and this guy who's completely conditioned, etc. It doesn't really fit in in there. So it looks as though he's on his way. And Spencer uh, mentions that he may as well go where he's wanted and needed, which I think is very important. He will be wanted at Celtic, and he certainly is needed. He's needed. The other wee thing that maybe change it, even Brian Potter's mind down there, is obviously the fact that Lewis Dunk, who's his partner, Shane Duffy's partner at Brighton. I talked about him moving on as well, you know. So they're going to have to get a full, complete central defence in. And look for two players that work together, Stephen. When he was on the the plane yesterday, the, their training, I think it's in Andrews, Brighton. So I think that's he was coming to Glasgow, but it wasn't a East End. <laughs> it wasn't a sign for us, uh, which is unfortunate. What's your thoughts on the continuing um, question around whether or not? Eddie's going to remain at the club. We know that we've brought in and we've invested well in a Yeti. We were all impressed with the obvious uh, at the weekend there. However, there's still this question of Aston Villa um, circling Celtic Park looking for a deal on Edward. I think we've said before, um, unless it's £40 million, we won't, we won't be interested in that, will we? I think it would depend on Eddie's attitude to this. The fact that he stayed in Glasgow during the lockdown, I think it's testament to the boy's strength of character. So I don't think he would go to the first suitor and I think if he stays injury free we won't have him forever but to go to Aston Villa I think it would be a negative move regardless of what wages and salary goes in. I was watching something at the weekend and I heard you guys last week about Kieran Tierney and it's a short career. But see if you're that way inclined, Celtic minded and you're getting 35 grand a week at Celtic for 15 years, mm. you're no retiring skint. No. You know, no, so you're absolutely right. I, I, I think there's a, a balance, you know, and all, all, all the things, and I'm going to go back to a, a terminology, and please excuse me, see all this birthday pish that they all came out with <laughs> to talk about Celtic. It's nonsense. They want to go because they want to go. Wouldn't they have any bad feelings against any of these guys? But if you go, you're part of our history, but you're no part of our present. So... Move on, enjoy yourself, but don't come, come, keep coming back and trying to get credit or due with the Celtic fans. When you're left, you're out the door. You're away. That's yeah. it. And we wish them all the best. Yeah, that's, what we, that's what we've been saying to player, uh, 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 regarding uh, old players that's away or current players that want to go. All the best. See you see uh, maybe later in the future. But now is the time at Celtic Park to have no indecisiveness, Stephen. Let's look at the players that's coming in. The players that's away, they're gone. And I agree with you on the birthday A car thing. But players that's coming in, that's the big that's the big uh, one for us, I think, Paul. It's who's coming in, who wants to play for us now. Mm. Now. I, I agree with that. And uh, there's another player who there's question marks over his future, Jim. He's a player that you've kept an eye on due to your involvement in youth football and it's Karamoko Dembele. So obviously he was involved in uh, the early squads this season. He's disappeared from view. There are question marks around whether or not his head's been turned Aye. and he might be on his way. What's the latest on that? Uh, I would, uh, if he wants to go, let him go. If he wants to go, if he's, uh, if he's no, uh, he wants to play for Celtic. He, he's, doing the, he's doing the same road, he possibly, he, sorry, I'll rephrase that, he will possibly go down the same road as road it is uh, as Farouz. Farouz, uh, uh, seven, 17 clubs, I'm sure it is to date. Tommy put everything into him. Tommy Burns done everything he could for that lad. Everything. And he went away. He went away behind the Celtics back down, down south. Mm. You know, he ended up at Chelsea. Behind the back. You don't do that to people. You don't. You you're up front. If you're a professional, you're up front, and you put your thoughts across. So young Dembele uh, uh, has got to get himself uh, focused on his football. 
and not just be outside the sources that he may be involved with and talking to and people turning his head. If he wants to leave, let him go. On you go, sell him. Get, get what you can for him. But they might say, oh, we want to keep him. We might want to develop him a wee bit more, Stephen. Uh, keep him here, get more money. Uh, don't ever be afraid of losing uh, something that you've not really got if their heart's not here and they don't want to be here and uh, and they want to get bigger money or they see the grass is green on our side. Uh, so, sorry, I went on a wee bit there. So in short, see you later, Karamoko. He's definitely the most hyped Celtic youngster since Islam Farouz. I think the comparisons were inevitable. Uh, we didn't want him to go down the same route as Islam Farouz has gone down. And that was a, a dead end journey for, for Islam Farouz because he's out of the game. Karamoko Dembele, you know, these agents, I think, uh, are, are, you know, they've got a lot to answer for Stevie. But every young kid is asking for a transfer. Are you of the same view as Jim? You you let him go, despite the fact that you've invested numerous years in his development. I don't think you can stop him. <coughs> Excuse me, Jim's got a, a much greater knowledge of youth football than I'll have. But I also believe that everybody involved at Celtic through the youth system, culminating in Neil Lennon, will know everything about Karamoko Dembele. So yeah. if he goes, I think he's got a year left in his contract. And if he wants to go, I think it's a million pound development fee. Ten in a row, I wouldn't be wasting any efforts to keep him if he's making it clear that he wants to go. If there's a chance to sign him in a longer term deal and the boy's committed, the same as like the wee boy Turnbull overcoming adversity, I would rather have that than somebody who's maybe more gifted but wants to act to go up. Uh, I wouldn't be wasting my time on people like that. You yeah, think what happens is they, they they actually they actually think that they've become superstars. Yeah, and he, become he's superstars. Only, he's only played what three games? Three games for the first team. He's he's not a superstar. He's a he's a Celtic a squad player at the moment. He's right. young. He's, At that age, Jim, your head can be turned oh, absolutely. by the riches that you're going to get, uh, the great aye. career that we can promise you. But that's by an agent. That's of course no, it is. That's no by sitting maybe in front of guys like Frank Lampard and going, we we'll get you in the team. This is just an agent saying, I can get you anything. That doesn't enhance your career. It only gets you money and that only lasts a certain amount of time till you go down the same path and you can't get a club. Mm-hmm. You're right, Stephen. And nobody forget... The agent's not going to get you on that park. The only person that's going to get you on that park and won honours and won the trophies in the football game is you as an individual, you as a player. Your agent can tell you and promise you this and promise you that. Oh, we'll get you 20 grand a week, we'll get you 50. But the, but what, are they, what are you going to do as a footballer and your ambition? As, for your ambition to win things in the game, they're not going to get you that. That's up to you as yourself. But you see that what you're saying about the agents? You're a hundred percent. They turn their heads. They turn their heads. Take their focus away. For what they what they should really be focusing on, and that's their football and their sport. The sport that they're in, they've got to concentrate on that. So, Dembele, Dembele, Stephen. I'm glad you said that. If he wants to go. He goes. But if you're in a dressing room, Jim, that's full of strong characters, yep. and they've all got the same amount of money as you're getting, Doesn't matter. Aye. you've got to be a good teammate Correct. to get in the team. Your, your bank book won't get you in the team. No. It's going to be, as I said to you last week, players will test you every single day. They, mm. They'll not care yep. what deal you've got. When you're out in the training field and you're lacking in something, they'll punish you. Oh, they're on top of you. And then it's a hard, hard environment to escape from. Aye. Now, before we get on to the, the main headline of today's discussion in relation to the, the songs that we sing at Celtic Park or, or will we sing them again at Celtic Park? Jim, uh, we had a very special couple of guests at the weekend. Oh, yes, yes. And we were speaking to um, both Erin and Desi McElroy and we were talking about Desi's fight against cancer. He's fought it off. It's come back for a fourth time. Yep. He's in the fight of his life and yep. everybody wishes him well. We're going to be doing a wee fundraiser. I know that um, they're already going to 
auction off or raffle off rather a signed John Hartson jersey and Mikey Mikovic who is from Dunfermline very kindly donated a signed Danny McGrain jersey now this is a replica it's not a match worn jersey but it is signed it's a 1980s style retro replica signed by the great Danny McGrain I can authenticate that signature I've got pictures of him signing it because it was me that got Danny to sign that so we will be running a raffle after Ern and Des have ran their John Hartson raffle just to raise some funds for Des. I also, Paul, isn't it great that uh, when Des came on, he, he 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 was very inspiring, wasn't he? He was, and his daughter. It was brilliant to see the the two. We'd never met them he, before. We met them a couple of hours before it, but after it, we felt as if we've known them all our lives. And and it great. I've, I've now found out that the guys are going to walk. Uh, from from Coat Bridge, Gart Kosh to the park and back again to help raise funds um, uh, uh, for Des for 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 Erin and uh, what she's trying to do uh, to help others as well. I think it's I think it's wonderful, and I was asked to to thank you as well, Paul, from the family and from uh, everybody up at the Columba uh, Club that watched you and all his family members. And uh, Barry McGlinchey, he gave us a wee message to say as well that um, after speaking with the family, Des said it's one of the best days of his life. That's amazing, eh? And you fulfilled, you helped fulfil a lifetime ambition that he wanted to go on and talk about Glasgow Celtic. Brilliant. How good is that? Oh, it's amazing. Well done. Well, the pleasure was all yours, Jim. Well the done. The pleasure was all yours. I think they were sitting when I last checked at around the six and a half grand mark. So Fantastic. still a wee bit to go for the target of 12. So hopefully we can raise a few pounds with Danny McGrain's help and Mikey Mikovic's help as well. Thank you, Mikey. You see, just before we start, Paul, if I could, I would just like to put a wee reminder to people who are maybe suffering now by bad mental health because I just read this morning that five people in Airdrie have completed suicide within the last couple of weeks. Yeah. Four males and one female. So if you're struggling, get somebody to talk to and maybe try and overcome this terrible thing that we're going just now. I'm glad you said that, Stephen, because it's very, very important because people might be uh, going along looking uh, normal or whatever, but they're paddling underneath and they maybe just need somebody to talk to. And I hope you don't mind me saying this. Again, I can't praise you high enough for the work that you do at St Rock's, for Rock Talk, where the door is open for anybody to come along on a Sunday. Yep. What time? 11 to 1. We were there again on Sunday, 15 meals across. We had fantastic help for each other. We had some laugh, and it was really, really inspiring. But it's the guys themselves, they're inspirational. Brilliant, pal. Brilliant. <laughs> Absolutely superb work that you do at Sitting Rock, Stevie, and as Jim says, and we'll reiterate it, sometimes, you know, I've I've had dealings with people whose loved ones have, have passed away under those circumstances, and it's the most difficult thing in the world to, to speak to them and because you don't know how they're feeling, right? But the big thing that always stayed with me is, you know, just if they did speak to someone, because tomorrow's another day, right? And you you do, it does get better and they will feel better. So the best thing for them to do is to speak to someone. And even if that someone in the first instance gyms us, if they think they can reach out to us, you just message us. And if we can put you in touch with someone who, who is better qualified to deal with their issues, then we're happy to do that. Yeah, and again, again, Paul, I'm, I'm going to point out that this show, uh, I, mean, I mean, yesterday... Uh, the figures were fantastic. Again, it's gone up and up all the time. The show where uh, people can put their views across and uh, it's part of their platform as well. Uh, it's a great show. So anybody can talk to us. Anybody can send a message. Anybody can send a message to Rock Talk. It's great. It's fantastic. There's great stories out there. There's no a story that you don't want to hear. It's all good stories that that come across and to help people is fantastic. There's a great wee saying good about in our gym. It's certainly not mine, I've only heard it. I'd la- rather hear your voice than attend your funeral. Yeah. So if anybody's struggling, please get in touch with somebody that can help them. Probably still. Yep. And as I say, if we are the first point of contact, we're happy to be the first point of contact, Stevie. So get in touch. Don't hesitate to get in touch. 
Now, the, the headline, we're going to have a look at some of the comments coming in uh, via Twitter, Facebook and YouTube. And what we've done over the last few days, we've certainly spoken about some of the, the topics that um, we will definitely look at, we'll debate, we'll challenge. There's nothing that we won't discuss on this show. And uh, one of the big things that is uh, is a topic for discussion is is the singing of certain songs at Celtic Park. And they've been outlawed over the, the last few years. A big discussion that Jim, Steve and I have had over the last couple of days is what um, constitutes a rebel song? What's a folk song? What's a Republican song? It's difficult to differentiate sometimes between the three. Uh, the club plays, let the people sing at the stadium, but we're not allowed to sing. There are certain songs you can and certain songs you can't. Now, Celtic would always find it difficult, Stevie, uh, to avoid the politics and symbolism of Ireland uh, based on the history of the club, which everybody who's watching this show will know. So... Irish songs, uh, symbolism, the tricolour, these are things that have always been debated around Celtic, you know, the tricolour famously. They tried to stop, I say they, the authorities, the SFA, tried to stop Celtic from flying the tricolour back in 1952. And uh, Robert Kelly, later to become Sir Robert Kelly, uh, stood firm, stood firm in his belief that Celtic should fly the flag. And the SFA president at the time was George Graham and the Hibs chairman was Harry Swan. And these two guys were very vocal uh, in Celtic not being able to fly any flag or emblem which had no association with football or Scotland. So they were basically saying to bring the flag down, Stevie. And as I say, Robert Kelly deserves an immense amount of credit um, for standing firm. It went to a ballot and the Rangers chairman, John F. Wilson, voted with a decisive vote in favour of Celtic flying the flag. The, the the question came up again 20 years later when Desmond White was in charge and again he stood firm and we continued to fly the flag. But having spoken to people like uh, Paul Smith, for example, Jim, even yeah. Fergus McCann uh, came up against the resistance of the SFA where part of the deal uh, to play at Hamden was that we couldn't fly the flag of Ireland at Hamden. So we've always been up against... Uh, you know, this attitude uh, against our Irish heritage for a club playing in Scotland. And the songs is something that back in maybe your day, in the early days of me going to watch the football, you heard songs that now are not sang at Celtic Park. And we're throwing it out there. What songs are acceptable? What songs are not? This came on the back of a, an article that you read, Stevie. So could you remind our listeners of the article that you read? I'll then go over to some of the comments and then we'll have a wee chat about it. First of all, let me state, my heart's bursting with pride at everything you said there. I'm proud of everything the club's done. All these great men in our history have stood up for us. I will never, ever, and I will never deny the great role that they've played. So my heart's bursting with pride at what you've just said. But this debate came about from an article I read by a guy called Paddy McMenon, And his bio is, he's an ex-IRA man. He was a former prisoner. He's six years in long case jail. He's a Celtic fan from Belfast, now he lives in Donegal. He's an academic, a writer and a teacher who embraces the peace process. He's fiercely anti-sectarian. In regards to his songs at Celtic Park, he denounces sectarian songs like Roman in the Gloaming with all the add-ons. He says it's nonsense and garbage. His view is it's unfortunate the people of Glasgow and Belfast have sectarianism in their DNA. He differentiates sectarian songs and rebel folk songs as our history against colonialism. We are not singing songs about killing people, we're singing songs about resistance to British rule. He loves hearing songs like Grace and Fields of Athen Rye sung at Celtic Park. So that's Paddy's view, who, again, when I spoke to somebody when I left here yesterday, he went, Paddy's view is the many more important than any other Celtic fan. And again, that's what makes Celtic great. Everybody has an opinion. So I thought that was a great topic to discuss and to see what the viewers, their thoughts on it was. I think it opens that that discussion, Stevie, because when you look at uh, the songs that have been um, sung, you you mentioned um, Jim Kerr, yeah. uh, and I remember the press conference that he gave talking about the songs that uh, his forefathers would sing at Celtic Park and giving that back. I always look at the, the impact that Fergus McCann made when he came into Celtic. 
And uh, you mentioned the field Jathan Ryan again. You know, we know that's about the potato famine. And uh, although the famine was a, an act of God, that the actual uh, the relief of uh, Charles Trevelyan and, and uh, uh, Great Britain at that time has been viewed as, and I wouldn't disagree with this, as genocidal. And it's that oppression which obviously forced, they reckon, two million people overseas, and many of them ended up in Glasgow. And uh, 40 years later, they were still without jobs and they were still, you know, in poverty. And obviously our great club were formed to feed the children of uh, various uh, parishes. And so when you look at the very formation of the, the club, and the history of that oppression, it was only natural that, uh, you know, with the, the Irish heritage that we have, that uh, Irish folk songs would be sung at Celtic Park. But the club has come on leaps and bounds to eradicate any form of bigotry. I think, and please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the first public airing of those those anti bigotry uh, messages was from Fergus when he came out with Boys Against Bigotry you'll remember it, Boys Against mm -hmm. Bigotry and it was a forerunner uh, for everything that's been done since then but he came up against um, people will, will remember Jerry McNee saying that the fields of Athen Rye even should be banned from Celtic Park and Fergus stood up to that and in actual fact he says you know I'm going to print the lyrics of that song in the Celtic view and the Celtic fans will continue to sing it but there are other songs and I take the point that um, the person who wrote that article makes there. Anything that glorifies the killing of anyone else, I think, needs to be eradicated. But we need to know our history. And we keep singing about knowing our history. So there are certain songs and certain figures that I don't think should be offensive in any walk of life, and certainly not at Celtic Park. There was a massive thing for me looking at the offensive behaviour at the Football Act, which everybody knows came into play in 2012. It was revoked in 2018. And there was a massive political reason behind it, in my view. And one of the, the reasons behind that uh, being in place was to justify police presence at the football. Because the police were facing a situation of one of the big earners, um, one of the cash cows for the police, was Glasgow Rangers. Because they had a game at Ibrox every fortnight, sometimes every week, depending on cup games. And they made a lot of money from policing those games. And we were actually viewing for the first time in over a century those games not existing. So I think the, the Lenny McCoy spat on the sideline was a smokescreen. We'd seen so much worse over the years between Celtic and Rangers, Stevie. I mentioned the 1980s Scottish Cup final, for example, which resulted in booze being banned from stadiums 40 years ago. Still banned to this day. Again, that's another debate for another day. Uh, but it had nothing to do with McCoy and Lennon falling out in the sidelines. This was a political act to ensure that they could justify their attendance at most football games, never mind Category A games. And how do you justify it? Well, let's introduce some legislation which allows you to lock people up. And that's what happened. Interestingly enough, it's been revoked in 2018 because they're guaranteed to get the Ibrox games back. So the purse is uh, booming again. So that's my belief. I would love for someone to come in and prove me wrong. Um, so that, that opens the debate. Back then, did people know what they could and couldn't sing? This is a massive thing. This is one for people who have represented those who have been arrested at the football game for singing a certain song. Did they even know that that certain song could or couldn't be sang? How was that? How were people educated? It was never written down a banned song list, was it? As no, far as I'm aware. No. There were some songs that were obviously banned that the, the people were told they couldn't sing, mm -hmm. usually after they'd been arrested. But you, you actually educated me before we come on here, telling me all those things about the Offensive Behaviour Act, you know, in 2012 to 2018. It was absolutely wonderful to hear. Personally speaking, I think there's got to be sort of some parameters about what's sung at the park. Again, I know an age thing will come in, I know alcohol will come in. But an example that I would use, and again, this is only my opinion, it's not a view of Axon, this is a view that I have. One of the last times we were at Hamden, and I was in the main stand, and I looked towards the Celtic end, or the traditional Celtic end, and the fans were singing a rendition of Grace that made me tingle. It was, you're ready for crying, and I thought, wow, this is magnificent. Then the same group of fans go into a chant about orange, 
bees. And I can't think for the life of me why we would put ourselves down to that level to sing that. I don't know the reason why you would do it. I know some of the people who would, they're really creative and I don't know who they think they were inspiring Mm. by that chant. So personally speaking, I would find that offensive much more than the traditional songs, which would be either rebel songs, Republican songs, folk songs. A lot of them I don't find offensive, but I would find a chant like that offensive. Mm -hmm. I, I found the lack of education was a difficult one for me to swallow because it's a very grey area, um, a lot of the songs, to the point where even some of the high-ranking focus officers in the early days couldn't decide whether or not the role of honour was offensive or not. But they were locking people up anyway and they were sending it almost as tests to the court and let them deal with it, let them decide if it's an offensive song. If if there was a you know a, a line drawn in the sand, whereas you can sing this song, you can't sing that, and these are the reasons why, at least then people going to the games know the parameters. But I think with that, and that would maybe become more of a problem for away games. And again, I don't think it's any coincidence that Celtic are always usually sent to Dingwall and remember on Sunday. So the guys are all tanked up on their buses and then you go into the full song sheet. I think they would test even the parameters on days like that because they've got a wee bit more false courage. Anybody who's got the courage or their convictions to sing these songs and their beliefs sober, I've got their back. But I'm not going to do it when somebody's under the influence of alcohol and then they would deny it was them that sang the songs on the Monday morning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but because... I think that's a totally different script, you know, to, to base your beliefs on. Jim, I'm going to come to you in a wee second. Let's have a wee look at some of our comments coming through thick and fast on Twitter, Facebook and YouTube. It's great to engage with the fan base because there's only three guys in here with three different states of mind and three different viewpoints. So first and foremost, let's have a, a wee comment from Ryan Byrne who's commenting via YouTube. He says, it's a lot more common at away grounds than paradise, just like you say there, Stevie. But don't see anything wrong with the song sung. Unless they were tasteless or bigoted, always will be a vocal Irish Republican element within the fan base. And I think, you know, we've already accepted that there will be because of the heritage of the club and the traditions of the club. And when you look at the fan base, you know, you many of the fans could trace their their, their family tree back to Ireland. I'm not saying everybody. We're a club open to all, Stevie. But many of them can. So when you're growing up, and I said this yesterday to Kevin, because both of us travel through in supporters' buses being outside of Glasgow. And you hear the songs, and then you hear them at New Year when your family all gets together, and they're all from Irish stock. Mings are the Maguires from uh, High Valleyfield that go back to Donegal, and I think that's just, you know, that's a, a kind of story that most people can relate to. And then when you get a wee bit older, you start to find out more about them, and then you can make a an actual decision based on facts as to whether or not you agree with singing them or not. And then you're told by law that you can't sing them. So it's a it's an open debate. Please keep the comments coming in. And uh, we also have Gary Doonan. Always welcome on the show, Gary, commenting on Facebook. This is a wee mention about Pat McCluskey, who we spoke about earlier. There's a quote here. The bigger they are, harder you hit them. And that was, that was true about Pat McCluskey. Rest in peace, Pat. A real decent player. Maybe never got the real plaudits. Saw him score penalties in the 75 Cup final the 74 Dryborne Cup final and two penalties in the famous 3-3 game against Benfica. So he must have had nerves of steel to stand up and take the penalty, Stevie. I mean, i never seen Pat McCluskey. I've heard plenty about him. Quality player. Quality. Quality player. Jim, what's your thoughts on the debate in relation to the songs that we sing as Celtic fans? Just listening. And uh, how do you learn your history? What would what we even Woody Guthrie when he wrote that song, Paul? Uh, you know, um, this land is our land. You learn from songs. Mm-hmm. Growing up, I come from uh, uh, Irish Italian background. Uh, my mother's uh, my mother's side, uh, uh, from Sligo, and. When I was younger, yes, they would all sing uh, songs, but they sung songs when we were younger with passion. They sung it with heartfelt 
knowledge about their grandparents and their grandparents, great-grandparents, and the hardships that were bestowed upon them back in the days before they came here to Scotland. Those songs were handed down in a line for everybody to sing and for everybody to remember. A lot of people don't know uh, a lot of the historical Irish songs. They don't understand the meaning of these songs. They're starting to be educated, maybe, now about the songs and what it means. So if you look at, if you look at, uh, even let's go to the one that you mentioned, Roll of Honour, that's still an educational song to let people understand that um, uh, that these these men uh, believed in a cause and they died for, for that cause. So that's part of history. And it should never be forgotten. Your history should never be forgotten. History and how men want to go about and what they believe in. That's that's an education. And should that have happened? Should never have happened. Should never have happened. But, but that government then, Margaret Thatcher and her government, they allowed that to happen. But people were singing about it today that hopefully it'll never happen again. So that's one element of your song. You talk about the song Grace. A beautiful song. Fantastic song. Again, it's about it's about Irish history. It's about a, a, a woman who's in love and a, the man that she married is, is getting taken to a, his death because of something that he believes in. But when you put it across and you sing it, uh, the way that it's passionately sung and portrayed is fantastic. The Fields of Arthur and Rye, the, the try to ban, again, if you if you if you listen to the song or if you look at the lyrics and then you understand the lyrics and maybe then go and read about the history. Who was Trevallian? Who was he? Why? Why was people dying? Why were they dying when there was plenty to feed everybody? And the famine. There was plenty to feed, but they wouldn't feed them. So these songs portray our history. They portray an education. So whatever songs we're singing, if we can educate the world in these songs, and we can educate the young people, but not about uh, blowing people up. Or kill- killing's wrong. Even the thought of killing is wrong. It's wrong. But if we can show how our great-grandparents, what they had to come through, to get to today, to where we are today, to make life better for all of us today. Because let, let's be honest, growing up a way, way back, me being a, a Roman Catholic in Scotland was very, very difficult. But what they all had together, they had their songs and still remembering about the hardships that their great, great-grandparents had and their grandparents had. And that's where they wanted to change things as well for going forward for the children of today. But I learned songs. This is my own personal opinion as, as, as James Simonette. Nobody else's opinion, what I'm saying today. That I believe songs should be sung. Songs should be sung and stories should be told. But in a way that it's put across that the world will see that we're above and beyond anything that is offensive to people. Yes, and I agree with Stephen, and the man Paddy as well, Paddy McMiniman, I agree that colonialism was such was such a terrible thing back then, but now we've moved on for that. We've moved on and we've got to grow together and put our message across. If we want to, to get ourselves to the next level of football, whether it be a European league or an English league, we don't want to be seen as going along there and singing songs about people who, who have been unfortunately killed in circumstances uh, a way back. We, we want to hear the good things, but we don't forget what heritage mm-hmm. 
We don't forget our heritage. We remember it. We remember it and respect. We respect everybody. After all, we're a club open to all. Celtic football is a club open to all. And um, uh, I have no, I have no uh, negative uh, thoughts about songs, Irish, uh, a traditional historical folk tunes being sung at Celtic Park. See, Jim, when you look at some of the things the club have done in recent years, so for example, uh, we wore the poppy on the jerseys yep. and uh, we stopped wearing the poppy. And one of the reasons for that was because uh, of the protests at Celtic Park, largely from the, the Green Brigade, they're very vocal. Um, I agreed with that protest and I, I agree that Celtic Celtic's jersey should not be desecrated by the wearing of a poppy based mainly on the um, atrocities of the British Army and everybody knows that obviously 1972 and Bloody Sunday was one of the big ones that uh, was focused on when the Green Brigade made their statement and now we wear the remembrance of the Great Famine on our jerseys instead so I think the club does listen to the, the supporters Stevie um, and they do act and, and I think that for me the big thing for me was education so to, to use an example that of a song, Jim, that you won't hear at Celtic Park, a song by John Lennon, The Luck of the Irish. Yeah. And it's a song that, that I've got to say, Jim educated me with this. That's a song of oppression. He name checks IRA in it. It's not a song about killing. And for me, it's not offensive, but it's, a, it's definitely a rebel song. But it's an important song. Mm -hmm. It's an important song, hey, hey, Paul. These are important. John Lennon wrote that song. Because it was important to write, it was important to tell the people the story of, of what was going on. Mm -hmm. But but John Lennon also wrote a Sunday Bloody Sunday, that's which is another song. No, no, the one that Bono wrote, and he tells a story. And people throughout the world, he have written in songs to tell the world about what the British government done uh, to uh, to to Irish people. Not only Irish to, to Scottish mm -hmm. and whatever. So you go back to all the way back, uh, all the colonialism. If even you go back to the days when the British Empire uh, had uh, America as well. So George Washington uh, and whatever they thought they wanted to become independent. People want to become independent. They want to become their own their own their own people. But these great songwriters, when these write when they write, they write from the heart. And they want to tell the story. They want to tell the story to the people. But let's let's do it the right way. Mm -hmm. We'll have a look at some of the comments coming in. Red Scotland is commenting via YouTube. Thank you for getting involved again. Folk music is the history of the people who sing it. And these songs must be remembered and shared forevermore. Whether it's the Corries, the Wolf Tones, Hamish Imlach or Robert Burns, it's our history. Now that actually brings to mind um, the Wolf Tones. <laughs> at Celtic Park 1988 getting into the stadium and recording a video for the Celtic Symphony yeah. now I'd love to know the full story about that because I've seen a picture of the Wolf Tones with Tom Grant who was a stadium manager at the time Tom's been on the show might get back in touch with him I wouldn't have thought at the time Stevie that Celtic would have agreed to what the Wolf Tones did that day they've obviously let them in the park no nah. Again, I don't think Celtic can be associated with, with that comment that the Wolf Tones make. But your own introduction for people of our generation was the album that had the trickler on the back by the Freedom Fighters, which was produced in 1967. Yeah. The guy with a bonnet in front of you. Mm -hmm. You know, and the 10 songs that were on that album, which we grew up with with our parents, was Kevin Barry, The Merry Plowboy, The Boys of Cold Michael, The Wearing of the Green, Peter Crowley, Black and Tan Gun, My Only Son Was Shot in Dublin, Bull of Oak, Tipperary Far Away, and Roddy McCauley. So you've grown up in that. As things grow and become, see, that's predominantly before the start of the civil rights movement and then culminating in the Troubles. So you've got a great history of that. Do the viewers think that we should sing all the songs at Celtic Park or the reviewers think there's a cut-off point? Mm. That's the question. 
Can, can I go back to one as well? Well, the comments are coming in for the viewers. Thick and fast there, actually, Paul. And I just seen the other day that your comments are up by over 800 per day. That, that is amazing figures. Let's go back to 1957. Anthony James Dunnigan, otherwise known as Lonnie Dunnigan, number one record. America, number one record in the UK. He records Kevin Barry. And they go, oh, I'm not bringing that out. And he say, and he records the Dying Rebel. That's that's put in the archives. But there's a way back. There's a man originally from, from Brighton and Glasgow. His family's from Brighton and Glasgow. So he sings about his Irish history. But it, the, these songs were not allowed to be played, Stephen. And you're right. We grew up with all these songs. They were part of our family. Part of our family. that they, they all sung as well. And, you know... I'm not arguing against the history, Jim, no. or, or the beauty, or the magnificence of these songs, the songwriters, or the singers. What I'm asking, and again, I can ask you both of yous, or I can ask your viewers, do you think there's a cut-off point? When I was when I left here yesterday, I spoke to one of my closest oh. friends, who's a bit older than me, yeah. and I says, what do you think? And his answer, plain as anything, F them, sing what we want, and I'm proud to be a Roman Catholic. That was his point of view, and he's going to sing the songs regardless, and he's older than me. But you have stated, Stephen, everybody's entitled to their point of view. No, it's what I'm saying, but if you're going to Celtic Park, that's your paradise. You know, I've been moved to tears at Celtic Park, going through maybe some trials or tribulations in my yes. life, some deaths in the family, and the Celtic fans are singing, oh, they would never walk alone. Brilliant. And I'm in tears, but it's pride in my club, pride in the passion of the supporters, I've got no recourse or no affiliation with Orange Bees being so. No, no, so I'm what agreeing. I'm saying is, where do we draw the line as Celtic fans? No looking for Peter Law or Jai PT, you can or you can. Where do we decide there's a line? Or do we decide universally there's no line? No, I, I would agree with you. I think there's a line. Uh, you, you talk about you'll never walk alone. One of the greatest songs ever written. One of the greatest songs ever ever, ever written. And it brings you, it brings you with all the different emotions at Celtic Park when you think of your family, the loved ones that's gone who used to sing it. They love that song. That's a beautiful song, fantastic song. I agree with you. There should be a line. We we've got to be above everybody now, above every other football club. We're Celtic Football Club. Here's what we're going to sing, and here's what we're not going to sing. See if you want to go and sing these songs in private or whatever, uh, in public elsewhere, sing them. But at Celtic Park, let's let's draw the line. But as, you, as you have your upbringing, and I remember traditional New Year's party, you went with your mum and dad, your brothers and sisters, to your aunties and uncles and right. your grannies, and that's where you had the party. Yep. My uncle James, God rest him, who never left the gang, God, all his life, he died well in his 80s. His song was Sean South. You know, there wasn't he, oh, well, let's sing an Elvis number or <laughs> Matt Perry Como or Matt Monroe. Yeah. It was an Irish rebel song he sung. So I've grown up with these songs. But at Celtic Park, and I really i am inquisitive, it's not to get people engaged. I just want to know the views of the majority of Celtic fans. I spoke to young Declan, who's a regular contributor last night. And he said he would find it very, very difficult to differentiate because it's the songs that sung the pub and the bus got to the game. Mm. I spoke to my two nephews in their 30. One of them had the same example as, F it, we'll sing what we want. It's brilliant. Another one went, sometimes it's a wee bit naughty. So we, we have a, a real difference of opinion and I would just want to know the opinion yeah. of the majority of the fans. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And that's why we're using the platform to open up this discussion, Stephen, is... Jim quite rightly says we do get um, a hell of a lot of comments coming through every single day. We can't go through all of them, so I'm going to pick a few out um, to see what your views are. And uh, First of all, James Downey, songs about freedom from tyranny should be allowed to be sang at the club. Songs about living under oppression. Songs about solidarity should be allowed. But yet, across the pond, they're allowed to chant about killing Catholics. The songs we sing are deep-rooted from Irish heritage. This should be allowed. But I think that goes back to the point you made. Um, if you're talking about any kind of atrocities, if you're talking about taking a group of people, and in the case, the example you used, orange people, 
and then you're you're chanting against them, cut it out. I think you should cut that out because if you're talking about oppression um, or or freedom fighters or fighting uh, the tyranny, that's one thing. But there, we're now in a situation uh, due to the, the more modern IRA, if you like, that any mention of the IRA, regardless of what era you're referring to, will be deemed as offensive within a football park. Yeah, And that, I think that's sometimes a difficult one. That's the one that's on a knife edge, Stevie, because... You might be looking at uh, some people who were who influential in the early days of Irish uh, Ireland's fight for freedom, and if you sing about them, and there's any mention of the IRA at that stage, people will say, "Well, you're singing about a terrorist organisation," and that's the difficulty because you want to celebrate Ireland's past, but in doing so, you are deemed to be singing about a terrorist organisation. That's the difficulty, and that I think was where the lack of education or knowledge. Um, created a lot of problems when they tried to criminalise the situation and criminalise people for singing it. Um, so again, as Jim will be able to see from the screen, we've got loads and loads of comments coming and, in. And it's a great a, a question that Stephen's brought, good debate that Stephen's brought up. It's fantastic before everybody goes back to the a, the stadium. It's fantastic. And give everybody a, the, their views. It's but, but absolutely wonderful. If you wonderful. give everybody the platform here, which this show does, Jim, one of the points that continuously crops up, a lot of Paul makes, about if we move from our current yeah. surroundings. Yeah. If we go, and I've suffered this because we get battered when we went to play Birmingham in a pre-season friendly years ago right. because we're classed as the IRA club. Do we try and break away from that or do we stick to the traditions and just, again... Do we sing what we want and be tagged as an IRA club? Put out to the viewers. Again, uh, a good met, a good uh, comment coming in from Red Scotland. As the saying goes, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. For me, everything is fair game. I'd rather hear a song that offends me than silence the freedom to sing it. And I think a lot of people have that view. Um, there's also, I mentioned, and don't get me wrong, I wasn't calling uh, the IRA a terrorist group. That That is what they will be deemed if you sing that song and it's heard in a court of law in Scotland. Um, so, from Facebook, what reason not to sing Sean South? I'm confused. Confusion reigns in this situation, I think. And that, that yeah. was the issue when so many of these cases were going to court, Stevie, and being thrown out. Because the question was, is that offensive? You know, and I think the confusion started at the very top with the group that they set up to eradicate so-called offensive behaviour at football. They didn't even understand what was offensive and what wasn't offensive. But, but the songs that were sung in the 1780s are very rarely sung at Celtic Park now. But there is still few. I say Again, it's a great debate started by Paddy McMenamin. I've not started this debate, he started it. But I think it's a great talking point. Yes. You know, I think Celtic have got three categories with the songs I think there's a white that's permitted, grey that's dubious and black that's banned but even that won't ever come out to be quoted What I think we should do is it's a great topic that you can't uh, cover in full and I think we should return to that because the comments that are coming through will give us food for thought as well Stevie and you and I We'll uh, come back for part two, or is it part three, <laughs> uh, of this debate. It's fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Uh, one wee comment before we go, and this this is something that uh, Jim and I have spoken a lot about as well, Candyman32 via YouTube. Paul McCartney's song, Give Ireland Back to the Irish, was banned on British airwaves all th those years ago. Yep. Great show, boys. Listen, this is something that uh, we are open to all your views. Please share them with us. Stevie paints a fantastic picture there when he says that, uh, you know, white, grey and black when it comes to the, the actual transparency of this because it's not as clear as people think, Stevie, you know. Um, we have really enjoyed this. We'll enjoy the next part of it. Thanks everybody for joining us today and keep coming back to a Celtic state of mind.